For those who don't know me, my name's Gavin Begg. I'm the Executive Director here for Fisheries and Aquaculture at PIRSA. Um, Mike Steer on my left is the Research Director of Aquatic and Livestock Sciences here at SARDI and will be presenting the, the SNAP as assessment. Um, if you could hold questions to the end, so Mike can just run through the presentation. Um, I know this is eagerly awaited and it's a really important piece of work that SARDI has now completed. Um, this is the first opportunity we've got to effectively brief you guys as key stakeholders and then we'll be rolling out to broader public sessions over the next two weeks. So um, with that, we'll get straight into it. Um, as I said, if you could just hold questions to the end um, and then we'll have time to go through each of those. So over to Mike. Oh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, everyone to my right. So I'll just... All right, uh, so this is a combination of uh, the stock assessment report that, um, well, it's taken a, a, about a year in the making. Um, and today I'll just go through uh, the key research findings. Um, as we're familiar with uh, snapper, it's a, an iconic uh, South Australian species. It's a community shared species of, of importance, both the commercial rec, charter, Aboriginal traditional and 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 the consumers, so a, a, a very uh, a proudly community shared resource. It typically forms large aggregations to spawn. Um, these aggregations uh, and schools are provide a you know a, quite a, a good target for for uh, fishers. Um, you know we quite often see high catch rates around um, targeted schools, which uh, you know uh, presents alternative problems. It's a long-lived species. You know, it can live up to about 30 years of age. Um, if you look back and you know, back in the 90s and 2000s, and you see a, a, a little a little kid holding a snapper, chances are the snapper's older than the kid. So you know, very very long-lived. They're slow growing. Uh, they uh, take around about um, uh, four to six years to um, to enter the fishery. Um, so uh, uh, nothing happens with this species very quickly. They have variable recruitment. It means that uh, the the juveniles that are, are resulted from successful spawning um, uh, contribute to uh, replenishing the populations. And with snapper, we find that um, that recruitment is very episodic um, and 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 infrequent. And finally, we've seen over the years um, with our South Australian stocks evidence of stock declines, particularly in the Gulfs. So just a bit of Fisheries 101, just to get you back. Um, you, this is a, a typical population dynamics uh, uh, figure where we've got uh, uh, the fishable uh, biomass growing through time. As you can see, the, the fish uh, increase in size and diminish in, in numbers due to uh, natural mortality um, and also fishing mortality. And then we've got the recruitment, successful recruitment that uh, drives or the, uh, replenishes the stocks through time. What we find, the biomass can, um, can, can grow and respond on the basis of natural mortality and recruitment events. Uh, fishing mortality is the only thing that we can really control through fisheries management. A lot of the other processes that are underpinning uh, the, the increases in, in stock biomass are environmentally driven, particularly around recruitment. So we go straight to the key findings um, for uh, the report right up front. Uh, the assessment outcomes have indicated that there's been evidence of poor recruitment for uh, more than a decade uh, in, in both Gulf, so in fact more than two decades in Spencer Gulf and around a decade in Gulf St Vincent. <laughs> We've seen that the closure that's been put in place since November 2019 appears to have arrested the decline in biomass. Through our uh, egg surveys, um, we've seen uh, evidence of uh, higher levels of schooling of fish, starting to see that natural aggregation um, of those fish, those undisturbed uh, schools coming together during the, the summer months to spawn, which may be beneficial to increase the, that spawning potential into the future. But at this stage, we're not seeing any evidence of stock recovery um, at, at this stage. And I'll walk you through um, the, the science to support all, all those assumptions, all those findings. Right, a lot of information comes into the stock assessment. Um, there's multiple, multiple lines of evidence. Uh, and this figure here just demonstrates what we feed into the snapper assessment. We've got 
heavy reliance on fisheries dependent data, fishery statistics. We've got a considerable amount of um, statistics that, that goes back to around 1984. We also pull in very important uh, biological information, so understanding the length and age structures of, of the snapper populations, both regional populations and stock populations throughout the state. And we also input uh, a fishery independent estimate of, of biomass or abundance. And historically, we've used catch rates uh, as a way of coming up with an estimate of abundance. However, if you don't have a fishery um, operating, we don't have any catch rates to record um, in a closed fishery, for example. So we'll need alternative met methods. And we've used the, uh, um, the daily egg production method to come up with an estimate, an in fishery independent estimate of spawning biomass. And I'll, I'll step you through each one of those. All of those sources of information then get pulled into a, a SNAPEST model, a sophisticated model that then pumps out four metrics that we're interested in. Fishable biomass, which is the big one, that just tells us how many fish are in the water of, of legal size. Patterns of recruitment through time, so effectively the engine room of recruitment that's, that's there to replenish stocks um, uh, into the future and, and what has occurred in the past. What the general harvest fraction is, so that's uh, the proportion that is taken from that fishable biomass and what the egg production from that fishable biomass is. We pull all that information together uh, through a weight of evidence approach and then we come up with a stock status for each of the stocks. So these are the stocks that we're interested in. We've got three, three that occur within South Australia. We've got the Spencer Gulf West Coast stock, the Gulf St Vincent stock, and then we share the Western Victorian stock um, uh, with, with Victoria, so and that represents the southeast region. And we do an assessment on each of those three, or those two stocks in that southeast region. So here's the commercial fishery statistics that, that um, very much underpin a lot of the input into the stock assessment. And you can see for uh, Spencer Gulf West Coast, in this example, on the top we have trends in total catch. The green line represents the third highest, the red line represents the third lowest value. On the left here we've got trends in handline catch, uh, targeted catch, targeted effort and catch rates. And on these three panels on the right, um, on, this, on this side here, uh, are representative on the long line catch. So we've got two different fishing gears that we, that we uh, um, uh, uh, analyze uh, or, or consider in the assessment. So historically we've had, you know, back in the uh, 80s and 90s, a, a, a fishery around about 300 tonne, 300, 400 tonne. It increased in the early 2000s and then again in uh, around 2007. And then we've seen that subsequent decline down to very low levels that have been enduring for a number of years. You can see that the trends in handline catch and longline catch uh, in, in terms of their targeted catch have, have declined in, in, cor in corresponding to that overall decline, as well as a sequential reduction in targeted handline effort and uh, targeted long lines remained relatively stable over the past, well, when the, uh, towards the end of the, uh, the open uh, season. The other thing we're interested in too is the catch rates. Now remember I said these species aggregate, um, which means that catch rates provide us um, well with uh, information that we need to be cautiously aware of because in a school your catch rates can remain really high until you catch that last fish um, and then you'll see a, 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 real, a real crash of those catch rates. And we've seen evidence of precipitous declines in catch rates in the handline sector um, and in the longline sector historically. Similar for Gulf St Vincent, um, same, same information, total catch on the top, handline catch on the left, long line on the right. Um, we can see that historically Gulf St Vincent was a, a relatively low level fishery, around you know, less than 100 tonnes um, through time. And then we've had this real ephemeral sort of increase of population um, around that 2009 period, 2010. Um, Handline catches were relatively low, that targeted catches, and you can see the response in the in the long line targeted catch around that time. So the, the very much transitioned from a handline to a long line fishery in Gulf St Vincent. Um, you can see targeted effort for the long line catch went up 
in in cor well, corresponding to these uh, increases in, a, in in abundance, as well as you know uh, really high levels of catch rates uh, in CPUE uh, over that uh, 2010 to about that 2016 or so period where we started to see declines in those long line catch rates. So a very ephemeral burst of of of, uh, uh, of the population in, in, in Gulf St Vincent, and then you can see that it um, has slowly declined um, uh, in those subsequent years. Southeast region, this is the the, the stock that we share with Western Victoria. Um, the most of the uh, um, uh, recruitment is driven through successful reproduction and spawning in Port Phillip Bay. Um, as those animals, um, those juveniles grow, they spill out. Um, and then uh, 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 towards the west into our southeast region. You can see that historically the southeast region had very negligible um, snapper catch, and it wasn't until around about 2008 where we saw a, a pulse come through, which is effectively um, supported both the hand line and the long line sectors. And you can see catch rates um, in the long line sectors are remaining relatively high. And we've seen another little little blip, a uh, little increase in around 2020. So that just uh, identifies the historic um, uh, information that we get that's dependent on the fishery. Questions always get asked also, you know, how do we account for the recreational catch? This is a community shared stock. Um, uh, it's a, a really important um, uh, species for the recreational fishery. Um, and we do integrate as much recreational, all the recreational data that we have into the stock assessment model. So we, we base the information on the phone and diary surveys that were undertaken in 2000, 2001, 07, 08, 13 and 14. And we do have a, uh, just a plug, we do have a, a <coughs> recreational fishing survey um, coming out shortly. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. In the intervening years, um, you know, we have to uh, estimate uh, recreational catch and we do that on a proportional basis. So we, we understand the proportions that we've got through the recreational fishing surveys and we just apply that um, to the model. And then in recent years, particularly in the southeast, we've got the mandatory catch reporting since 2020 that's, that's really shaped or provided um, a more robust estimate of recreational catch for that region. So all those data um, get incorporated into the assessment along with the commercial catch, the charter boat catch uh, is, is, is incorporated as well. Okay, now another, so we've got the fishery dependent statistics. Another really important component that goes into the model is our understanding of the population demographics. So getting an understanding of the size and age structure of snapper populations throughout the state. So the ageing information is really important. So we, we have a, a, a routine um, a program where we go and access commercial fish or in a, during the close period, we, we've chartered commercial fishes to, um, to get us the samples that we need. We can then get size, age, sex, reproductive condition information from those, from those animals. Um, we take the otoliths out, we, we grind down the otoliths and we can determine the age. It's really important to get the age because it gives us a rate-based estimate for everything that we do in the assessment. Now, for the, uh, just an example, and in the report, there'll be age structures for each, each of the regions. So just as an example here, th these data are from Northern Spencer Gulf. You can see that from 2010, through to 2021, there's the age composition. But what I want to draw your attention to is that historically around 2010 through to about 2014, we had old fish in the population. So this red line just delineates the 10 year old fish. So everything to the right of this red line indicates fish that are older than 10 years. So you can see that we've had you know, a, a relatively good um, uh, showing of, of old fish, particularly those that were, were um, uh, you know, uh, in that recruitment year of 97 and 99 that persisted in the fishery through for a number of years. But we, if we look at the most recent um, data over, you know, from 2021 back, we've not seen those 10 year old fish um, in the same sort of numbers. Um, in fact, we're starting to see a truncation in the size of that composition of the fish that 
generally around about five to seven years of age that are contributing to that population. Now, if we go back to 1990, um, we're seeing fish that were 20 years old, 30 year old fish. Um, so we've seen quite uh, an erosion of those, those older uh, fish within, um, within both Gulf St Vincent and Spencer Gulf West Coast stocks. So it highlights the very important information that we have from a biological perspective to go into the model. The next bit is the fishery independent assessment of abundance. Um, like I said, historically we used trends in catch rates derived from the commercial fishing statistics. We don't have that in a closed fishery, so we need an alternative method. The daily egg production method has been developed for snapper since around about 2013, 2014, where we had an FRDC project to refine it. Over the years, we've got better at refining the information that goes into that. Um, this is effectively determines what the proportion of, or how many, how many fish are required to spawn the amount of eggs that we're finding in our, in our samples. The thing that we have to rely on with this particular method is um, making sure that we validate that the eggs that we're seeing are actually snapper eggs because they spawn during summer, time where a lot of other species are spawning. You have mixed plankton, a whole heap of different eggs from a whole range of different species. Many of them look very similar. Snapper in particular have a fairly generic egg. So it's really important for us to delineate or uh, um, identify those snapper eggs from all the others. And we've got a, a rigorous process in place where we uh, go through the plankton, we identify eggs of a, a particular size that are considered possible snapper eggs. We then refine that on the basis of our understanding of the morphology of those eggs. And we've had uh, samples um, grown on, uh, well, eggs grown on site, so we can get a really good understanding of what the morphology is. And then we go through and we apply a molecular probe that links um, the DNA uh, with a, 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 a substance that turns the um, eggs blue. So we can then identify snapper eggs from everything else. So we've got quite a really good stepwise approach to identifying those eggs. This is important information. I don't want you to get confused about this, uh, this the maths here. There's, there's two points that I want to highlight here. This is the calculation that we use this morning biomass. On the top line, the PO and the A, that <coughs> represents the information that we get from the egg survey. So where we go out and, 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 and identify patterns of uh, egg abundance. And then on the bottom, everything in the purple, that's the important bit that we get from the adult sampling. You know, the spawning fraction, the sex ratio, the weights, the batch fecundity, et cetera. All that information then comes in together to give us an estimate of spawning biomass for Spencer Golf and uh, Golf St. Vincent. So if we look at uh, the patterns of egg production since 2013, when we, when we uh, uh, developed the methodology, and you can see changes in, um, in the, 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 the sampling as we've evolved uh, through time. But if you look, uh, you can see the distribution of eggs. Um, the red represents the hot spots of egg, uh, of egg uh, abundance. So in 2013, we had um, a, a relative hot spot in the middle of the uh, um, northern Spencer Gulf. The pattern in 2018 was 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 um, quite quite well distributed. In 19, it was a little bit more peppery, and then we've seen a real contraction in 2021. And this is that uh, that the return to the aggregation behaviour or that schooling behaviour that we are hypothesising is is because the the, the schools have left la largely undisturbed. The area, the spawning area, is a really key um, fundamental part of the assessment of the of spawning biomass, and it does have quite a, a level of weight into the estimate of the, the spawning biomass. And you can see here through time that we've had a, a reduction in that spawn, that measured spawning area. And if we compare 2021 to 2019, it's been almost a halving of that spawning area. Interestingly, the number of eggs. That were um, that were collected both in 2019 and 2020 were virtually identical, but they were just more contracted into um, particular areas. Gulf St Vincent, um, similar story. Um, we saw that incredible hot patch in 2014, um, uh, just off of York Peninsula there. 
Uh, and if you can compare uh, the, the last two, you can see a real contraction in spawning activity um, from 2019 to 2021. And once again, we've seen that really large 58% um, decline in spawning area. Um, and there's been a, a, a reduction in the number of eggs that we've detected in that survey. So just to reiterate, we're seeing this contraction of, of spawning activity. And the hypothesis is because those, species, that those stocks have been left largely undisturbed. We're pretty confident in, um, in the fact that we've collected um, or really got a good understanding of the, the spawning activity. Uh, and this is a, a, a great figure to identify that. As we were going out uh, collecting the eggs, doing the egg surveys, we also um, uh, contracted commercial fishers because they're the best at catching the fish. We're the best at collecting the eggs. Um, and they went around uh, and simultaneously targeted the adults. Those spots that are red indicates um, those uh, um, snapper that are in spawning condition. So they are actively contributing to the spawning population with spawning fractions approaching 100%. And those that are in white uh, fish that were collected that were not um, in spawning condition. And you can see we've got quite a good overlap of those red dots, those highly active spawning adults and the distribution of eggs uh, as part of that, that survey. Right, so now we've got the fishery dependent information or the historic catch. We've got the biological information from our age, length, um, sex and spawning information. We've got an estimate of um, fishery independent spawning biomass or estimate of abundance. Now we put all that information together into our SNAPEST model. And these are the overwhelming results. So Spencer Gulf and West Coast here on the top. We have trends in the fishable biomass through time. And then in the bottom, we have patterns of recruitment. So you can see historically, we had a fishable biomass around 4,000 tonnes back in the mid 80s, dipped down a little bit, and then dropped up to around about 5,000 tonnes at about 2006, and then pre precipitously declined through to the closure. And you can see, and 2022 that we've arrested that decline. It's sort of flatlining. Some might say you might have a little bit of an inflection upwards, but there's no very there's no difference in those standard errors. You can also see on the bottom uh, the recruitment events from 1980. So what's that? Um, you know, 40 plus years of of data, and we can see three very clear recruitment of events. Now, if we join them up. So we see a, a huge um, recruitment event in 1991 that really helped build the biomass in Spencer Gulf. And then we had subsequent um, notable recruitment events in 1997 and 1999 that also contributed to bumping up that biomass. What you do see here is that recruitment does contribute to increases in biomass, but you don't necessarily see good recruitment when biomass is high because it's not a strong uh, stock recruitment relationship. What we have also seen that over the past 20 years or more in Spencer Gulf West Coast that we've seen no marketed recruitment events and a subsequent decline um, in, in biomass. And that would have been through, um, through fishing activity, natural mortality. Um, so you clearly can see a relationship around how recruitment <coughs> is required to replenish those, uh, those stocks. St Vincent, it's a... Uh, Different pattern, but similar similar philosophy, where you've got um, uh, you know fishable biomass historically was around about you know, 1,000 tonnes. We've seen that increase quickly um, into that 2008 period, uh, reflected of those catches that we saw earlier. And you can see how uh, recruitment events, which have been more frequent um, than Spencer Gulf, have helped contribute to um, uh, uh, increasing that biomass. And then a period of, of, of 10 years of, of low recruitment, although we did see a bit of a, 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 um, a, a blip in 2014, but didn't appear to manifest uh, markedly into that fishable biomass. So once again, those declining and reduced biomass through fishing. And we've seen uh, in 2022, the latest one where uh, we've arrested that decline, and that clearly would have been as a result of the closure. So I guess if you think about it like a, a bank account, you know, um, you, you, you have a savings account um, that 
you, um, you know, you, you deposit money in through time, and that's your recruitment, and you withdraw money. Uh, it appears in, in both Golf St. Vincent and Spencer Golf that we've been um, withdrawing from that account much more than we've been depositing. So if we pull that into a, a graphic, this is the one we saw earlier. So a, a historic sustainable fishery would look like this, you know, where you've got a healthy biomass <laughs> that's growing, you've got reproduction that's driving the, the replenishment of those stocks, you've got natural mortality occurring, and you've got fishing mortality occurring under, under some level of, um, of uh, management. Uh, and then if we look at what the situation we have now, uh, it appears that we've got a depleted um, fishable biomass, uh, not a lot of spawning potential because the, 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 the biomass has been eroded. Um, with that, we've got probably not uh, 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 the, the propensity for having um, strong recruitment events because you don't have that spawning biomass to generate the positive <laughs> recruitment. And we also don't have an understanding of what the environmental conditions are required to um, embolden that, um, that, that, that positive recruitment. So it appears that we've now got a, a situation in both Spencer Gulf and West Coast and GSV where we have these uh, depleted stocks. Southeast region, different story. Um, we, uh, um, on the top here, you can see that we've had that uh, increase in um, the fishable biomass. Uh, you can largely see that that's been driven by um, very strong periods of recruitment um, from Port Phillip Bay and there's surveys that occurred in Port Phillip Bay that be able to um, let us know or give us some sort of indication of those the strength of the incoming recruitment and relatively low uh, exploitation. Um, so this this southeast region is, is stabilised and considered relatively stable. The fact that we've got huge standard errors here is just reflective of that we've had to change how we've incorporated um, the uh, estimates of, um, of abundance through uh, standardising our catch rates. We've gone from a, um, a handline fishery to a longline fishery, um, and those uh, it, there's no comparability um, in that changeover. So we, what we've done is standardised our understanding of catch rates by looking at the number of hooks rather than the fishing gear. So the overall outcome both Spencer Gulf West Coast and the Gulf St Vincent stocks remain classified as depleted on the basis of low biomass and extended periods of poor recruitment. The expected time frames for recovery are unknown. Um, well, given what we know about the slow growth of snapper um, and the fact that we've got episodic recruitment, um, it's, it'd be very difficult to put in a time, but we can say that recovery may take several years or, or possibly longer on the basis of our understanding of their slow life history. And in the end, there's been no changes to the stock status. Spencer Gulf and West Coast are still considered depleted. Gulf St Vincent stock still depleted. And the Southeast region <coughs> that we share with the Western Victorian stock remains sustainable. So that's the overarching results from the stock assessment. The stock assessment is comprehensive and will be released shortly um, and uh, much, much greater level of detail in that assessment um, for your perusal. Just need to say there's a lot of work that has gone into this, and a pretty massive team. Um, the SARDI team has, has um, been singularly focused on delivering the stock assessment. We've had really good uh, collaboration with the marine scarfish fishers to uh, collect the important adult sampling um, and, and also the, uh, the charter boat sector and then the fish processes that also helped us um, ensure that none of those fish that were sampled went to waste and were donated to um, the food bank. That's it for me. Very happy to open it up to any questions. of the, well, they're here. In the two golfs. So the biomass estimate for Gulf St. Vincent is, uh, what is that, around 400, 400 tonne? Yep. And then Spencer Gulf, it will, it will be more than that, less than a thousand tonne. But that, that they will be in the report. Sorry, I didn't see if there's anyone online.
There's no one online, so it's just us. Okay. I've got another one. Um, which is the contraction of sporting areas, because obviously, you know, given that is a key driver in terms of the equation as well. Um, and the alignment of surveys so I assume in simple terms, if you have a contraction of sporting area to see recovery, you expect to see a huge amount of eggs in that contracted area through that period of time. So mm -hmm. it's probably for me about the alignment of the surveys with the spawning time. Is probably yep. Question. Yeah, and look, that's so if you go to this figure here, or this, so what happens, the alignment, so say for example, spawning fraction is low, so we're not seeing. What we, we can adjust for the relative proportion of spawning activity by getting an, an estimate of spawning fraction. So if we're out there and the spawning fraction is 10%, then we adjust for that in the, the estimate of spawning biomass. So it is captured um, in, in the, the fundamentals for the daily egg production method. Oh, Danny? Um. I'm not quite sure if I saw harvest fraction for adults. Well, it'll be zero. It'll be zero because it's closed. Right. Prior to that. Oh, uh, no, that didn't put that in there, yeah. but it's in the report. Right. Yeah. And this spawning area, one, the contraction of the spawning area, how much sort of validation have you got against changing environmental conditions? Change, well, we've got some. Uh, it's a it's a real it's a real struggle actually to 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 understand what's driving recruitment. We are two years into a three year FRDC project that's trying to understand what the dynamics are that are shaping recruitment processes in our Gulf. What we do know from Port Phillip Bay, uh, there's been quite a lot of work done around patterns of recruitment there. Um, that it's really about the timing of the eggs that hatch and that grow to a larvae. With the flushing of the Yarra River, the nutrient mix of the phytoplankton, so they're effectively matching with their hat, the hatching with times of, of, of high food availability. Um, so they've seen that, that that's been like the you know the Goldilocks sort of a approach where conditions are just right. The difference that we have in the Gulfs compared to Port Phillip Bay is we don't have that input of fresh water. We have a <coughs> pipe saline or very, very yeah, very hypersaline northern part of the Gulf. Um, you know, so we, this project is looking at trying to disentangle some of those drivers that shape the recruitment. I guess you see the contraction, but it's actually in sort of different areas of the Gulf. Yeah, yeah, and look, um, I, I think uh, here, um, you know, we're seeing fish up in the northern part of the Gulf, you know, right up in the northern Spencer Gulf. I mean, I'll use my pointer. Up here, so we're catching, we're catching fish. They're just not in spawning. They're just not spawning up there. So um, the short answer is that you know that there there is likely environmental drivers, but we don't know what what they are yet. It doesn't seem to be an unexpected result, um, given our understanding of the life history of snapper. And given our understanding of the history of the fishery, and in particular those episodic recruitment events, we got any historic data pre nineteen ninety four that sort of yes. Is yep. So we go right back to the seventies in Spencer Gulf um, from nineteen seventy something. We've had I think five good recruitment events. Is there any evidence previously about this level of depletion regarding the data around that? Uh, well, the, yeah, in this, from, not, from this level of depletion, it's only more contemporary from 2006 or so. Yeah, but we do. And in fact, um, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of historic information um, that I think we're aiming to. Uh, we've had a, we've had a, a, a stalwart scientist that's been just, just just retired from Saudi, uh, who's uh, got quite a considerable amount of snapper expertise. And um, through his retirement, he's pulling all of that information together. Um, so we'll have it. Okay, well, that's it. 
Thank you. Well, thanks for your attention um, and appreciate you coming this morning. Um, uh, like Gavin said, we'll be on a roadshow um, providing this this presentation, the same one, um, and happy for you guys to reach out uh, with any questions um, once you've had a, a pour through the stock assessment. It's a big one, um, but feel free feel free to ask ask questions for scientific clarification if needed. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.